Hey there, Susie here. Before we get into today's episode, I want to share this special message with you. Now, my co-host Michelle and I love masterminds. Not only do we belong to masterminds, but we also host a mastermind. We started it almost eight years ago, and it is the premier mastermind for women business owners who want to grow their business with a specific focus on marketing. Now, this group is usually completely booked out, and very occasionally we open the doors and invite a handful of women in. So if you're growing your business, but you're struggling with feeling overwhelmed, or like you constantly have a split focus when it comes to your marketing, this could be exactly what you're looking for. We have an amazing time together and the women in the group are extraordinary. They're great cheerleaders, supporters, advisors and colleagues for you. And they're also seeing extraordinary results. We see people cracking the million dollar, two million dollar, three million dollar mark, launching new e-commerce sites that go from zero to ten thousand dollars a month in sales. They're doubling their conversion rates, they're growing memberships, they're selling courses, they're growing their personal brands, and they're getting all kinds of media exposure and speaking opportunities and so much more. You can learn more about the Mastermind and join the wait list over at herbusinessmastermind.com. We're going to open the doors soon, so you definitely want to be on the list to get an invitation. So head on over to herbusinessmastermind.com. Create content that attracts, converts, and keeps your ideal clients. This is Content Cells. Hi, you're listening to the Content Cells podcast, the show all about how to create content to attract, convert, and keep your idle clients. Welcome to episode 178. I'm Susie Daphnis, and here with me is my co-host, Michelle Falzon. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Hey, Susie. I am great, thanks. How are you doing? I am so excited about today's topic because this is something that I've dabbled in a little bit and um, I'm so excited because we're speaking to someone who hasn't just dabbled but has very successfully tried this uh, strategy and uh, it's something I'd love to do more of in 2022. And what I'm hinting at is this idea of a self-liquidating offer. And a self-liquidating offer or SLO as it's referred to is, as you know, Michelle, a marketing funnel tactic that's really designed to pay for itself while still feeding fresh leads into your marketing pipeline and growing your email list. So it has multiple um, reasons for being. And But basically, it means you get $0 leads if this works. And it's also a great way to have an infinite budget for your marketing and bring in qualified leads to buy your higher priced services. Yeah, I think SLOs or self-liquidating offers are the way to go for sure. And, you know, for anyone that's listening, imagine having a, a way to fund your paid marketing, the marketing that you pay for. Because often people tell us that paying for traffic just feels out of reach or perhaps they've been burned in the past by spending dollars they maybe didn't have on marketing that didn't work. You know, Facebook ads, you spent, you know, a few thousand dollars on and got nothing in return. And we get it. Your marketing budget is really precious. But what having a self-liquidating offer does is it helps you fund that process because, you get a return almost right away as some of the people who click on your ad buy that low dollar something that you're offering immediately. So instead of having to wait a long time to possibly maybe get something back much later in a sales process, you're crystallizing some of that money right away. And even if you're just breaking even, now you've got that lead who's already spent money with you that you can market to on an ongoing basis. I absolutely love this. And to talk about this, we invited a guest along who's used this strategy, as I said, successfully inside of her business. And her name is Brandy Mouse. I met her through the mastermind that I belong to. She's a very savvy marketer. Her business is called Serve Scale Soar and the Beta to Biggie Accelerator. And she teaches service-based business owners strategies to generate revenue fast so that they have more freedom. They create a financial financially successful and secure future for their family. And she is a mum. She's a podcast host, as um, you'll hear me say. I'll mention her podcast later. But she here's the thing. She transformed her family life by building a seven-figure business in just two years, um, giving the family more choices and freedom than she could ever have imagined. She's a young entrepreneur. She's a bright spark, and she's obsessed with helping women to take more action and to learn more. So uh, Brandy Miles. Let's check out the conversation now. Hey, Brandy, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much, Susie and Michelle, for having me. I'm super excited to be here. 
I am so excited to talk about this marketing funnel tactic, which just by its nature is designed to not only pay for itself, but also produce fresh, new, wonderful leads and to grow our email list. Now, this is the self-liquidating offer, and this is something that you've used successfully many times in your business. So we want to hear about that. So, But to kick us off, go ahead and tell us what is your take on what a self-liquidating offer is. Yeah, I think it's so funny when marketing trends come to more people's attention and it shows you the power of like having a really great name to something where in 2020, we really saw these like take off and people started naming them different things and got attention. But an SLL funnel or self-liquidating offer is like old school marketing. Like this goes way back. This is nothing new, but it's really cool when these things come back to attention and more people start implementing them. And so when I look at an SLO funnel, I'm saying like, how can I bring in leads that help cover my ad costs? This isn't something I'm looking at to like quit my job, make a living (laughs) off of, but something that can like help bring in warmer leads than let's say a PDF download, because someone has spent, even if a $37 $37 or a 17, a buyer's a buyer. And when we can offer them a low entry point into our world, it can really set them up for our bigger items that we may have, whether that's a reoccurring membership, a course, a mastermind, whatever it may be. And you're absolutely right. When someone has purchased there, it's a totally different animal to someone, you know, who, and I do that too. You know, I just find the free PDF and I never perhaps have an intention of buying. Um, So that definitely warms them up. But how does it typically work? How does an SLO typically work? Yeah. So there's all different ways to do this. Um, The main thing with an SLO is I think the mindset that I'm going in knowing this is going to liquidate my ad spend. So I'm not going to make a ton of money. I'm just going to liquidate. And so I think the original ones you would see would be like a book, like a free book with pay for your shipping. Those are SLOs. But also what we've seen now is like template packs and mini courses or workshops that are between the price of like $10 and 37, maybe pushing 47. And then there's usually upsells along the process. So if it's just this one item in the front, that's typically not going to liquidate. So there's usually upsells, but this is different than a tripwire. So it's not like we're going to a page afterwards and then there's like a countdown and timer and all this kind of stuff. It's more of an always open evergreen system that has multiple steps to it. Okay, great. I'm so glad you made that distinction within the tripwire because it could be very easy to, you know, to hold those two things as the same thing. So thank you. Yes. So we've talked a bit about an SLO or a self-liquidating offer being designed to create these zero dollar leads. You know, you said, I'm not going to make a lot of money, but I'm going to make back the money that I've spent acquiring the lead. What else does a self-liquidating offer do other than create those zero-dollar leads? Yeah, so I think the big benefit of this is really warming up and nurturing an audience who is more qualified, and this is a very blanket statement, so it's not always going to be true, but more qualified than just those freebie seekers. These are people who maybe they want to be in your world, Maybe they've listened to your podcast, but they're not ready to take that next step. I always think these are the people who move a little bit slower in buying decisions, and this is a way to warm them up or bring in completely cold audience. So it's a great way to audience build without building a list of freebie seekers. Because for me, my email list would probably surprise people about the size of it being on the smaller size for the amount of revenue. But one thing is we don't have any like traditional freebies that we're giving out. It's either a low ticket offer or an evergreen webinar or a live launch that they're coming into our world. And so with that, it builds up a smaller email list because you're not going to have as many people joining right. because it is paid, but they're more qualified and they're quicker than to fall in love with you and make the next buying decision easier. So really it's about creating a lifetime value for your customer instead of just having one opportunity to work with you. 
I am liking this a lot. And you've used this very successfully in your own business. So tell us what are some of the elements of successful SLOs? Like, you know, three to five things we should definitely consider when creating an SLO. And we'd love to hear how you've used it. Yes. So my first SLO was a complete flop. And this Oh, okay, great. (laughs) Yeah. I think it's always great to start with that. Absolutely. So um, my first online product ever, and this is going to set me up for what makes a successful one is the first digital product I ever brought to market was through a challenge to get your first funnel up. And I did this and it was an SLO and I did all this work, built it out and it totally flopped. But there was only one step. There wasn't the upsells and the downsells. And I didn't focus on my messaging. It wasn't specific. So when, and like, that was awful. Then I launched a membership. And then in 2020, I really dove into the SLO and they added multiple six figures to our business. And so, and it wasn't supposed to do that. It was just supposed to liquidate our ad spend. And so what makes a successful SLO compared to a very unsuccessful one, which I've experienced both is a successful one. You know, your audience, like, you know, your messaging, you know, their pain point. And so you can pinpoint one specific problem that you can help them solve. It's not about solving all their problems, but one specific. So an example of this is I help online service providers scale their business. And I know one specific pain point that they struggle with is having systems and specifically how to set up their CRM to bring in new clients. So my first SLO I brought in was called Delighted with Dubsado. And it showed them in 48 hours how to get their Dubsado set up from scratch. And so it solved this very specific pain point. So when you're creating an SLO, you need to solve one specific pain point that your audience is struggling with, which means you have to know what they're struggling with and you have to have messaging down. The second thing that makes for a very successful SLO is having a quick win. This isn't a course. This isn't like supposed to be drawn out, but how can you get them wins? So anything with templates or um, checklists or something they can implement very, very quickly is going to make for a successful one. And then three, you're talking to a very specific audience. So as I go through these three things that make a very great SLO, it's all about how specific can you get with this offer? Oh my gosh, you're just singing my song. I love it. (laughs) Good. In fact, I was um, just giving some advice quite like this this morning to somebody and it, it really, I think it is such a mind bender to be specific. I think people feel like I've got to be broad because then I'm going to get more people interested. And it is such a leap of faith. I think that first time when you say, no, I'm just going to solve this one teeny tiny, very specific problem. And I just love that you are again, encouraging our audience to do that. And I'd love to ask, like, was that a, did you have to make that leap? Was that a big problem for you kind of going from, no, I want all the people and I'm going to solve all the problems to I'm just going to focus on this very specific part of somebody getting their CRM set up? Well, I think the great thing about an SLO when used correctly is I'm not using it to like leave my nine to five. I'm not using it as our main way to make money. So it's not how I started. I don't believe this is the best strategy for people who don't have something to lead people into. Mm -hmm. So when you have a course, a membership, you should already have the focus of who that is. Maybe you've already niched down and everything. And then what I want you to do is within those programs, what's that like juicy, quick win that you're already solving in your program? How can we now take that out? And that's what we're marketing because then it's like, this is something that's specific to what I already teach. I've already created most of the assets. So then it's also about efficiency. But if you can solve that one thing that you're already teaching in your program, you just pulled it out. You know that those people are going to be a good fit for your program. Because one thing that you can do with an SLO is since they are lower ticket, you can start attracting a bunch of the wrong people and sure you'll pay for your ad spend, but they're never going to join your membership. They're never going to join your course. They're never going to join your mastermind because your SLO didn't fit into your offer suite that you already have. 
Excellent. 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 Mm-hmm. Lovely. Yeah, really important distinction there. And you've given us already a couple of mistakes in that, you know, not being specific enough and perhaps not making it relevant to the thing you're selling next. But I'd love to know, are there any other big mistakes you see people typically make when they're creating and promoting their SLO? Yes, I think there's three big mistakes that they make besides the ones that we've already talked about. And we have kind of talked about this one, but just not, we tend to put out offers and expect immediate return and in the online space and knowing going in with the right mindset that I will probably only break even, but even because the ad game has changed. So in 2020, if we would have had this conversation, I would have said, you can make money off of these funnels. The ad game has changed. And so now we're looking to break even, or even if we lose some money on the front end, knowing if it, the offer aligns, you'll make it on the back end and it's still better than running ads to a free offer. So I think mindset and having the right mindset about how this offer works is the biggest mistake that I see people going in with. It's just the wrong mindset around how these funnels work. The second one is they put way too much stuff in it. This is not a course. This is like a low ticket offer. Do not give them everything under the sun. Leave them wanting more, but solve that one promise that you already told them you were going to do. So don't fill this up as a course that you could sell for $4.97, which I've seen a lot of people do. It's just too much information. And then they overwhelm themselves making it. And then the third one is they don't, they want to run straight to ads without like selling this to their warm audience. So one of the benefits about already having a program before you create an SLO is a lot of the content you're just reusing for your program. So it's not going to take a ton of time to make, but you do have to make your funnel. So that's the tech, the sales pages, the checkout pages, you know, you have upsells and all this kind of stuff. And so it takes time to get that up and you can't really pre-sell these. So how can you create this funnel and sell it to your warm audience first before you go and start running ads to cold audience before you even know your numbers, if this is going to convert. So those are the three big mistakes I see is people just not having the right mindset. And then the other one is over delivering, like giving just too much stuff. And the third one would be that they don't sell it to their existing audience before reaching out to cold audience with ads. That's such a good distinction. So good. Because I will often, you know, and I would have made this mistake probably is thinking, well, I want new people, therefore I'm going to go out to a cold audience. But I love, I love what you just said there. That's great. Yeah. And we always send it to our email list first, Mm. and then Mm. we'll run ads, but just to our warm audience. And we see how it starts to convert. If we're hitting our target numbers, then it's like, we're like, okay, let's start sending this to cold audience now. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about who can use an SLO. So, uh, you know, what types of businesses can use self-liquidating offers? I know the Her Business community has a diverse range of businesses, online, offline, people selling low-ticket items, people selling selling expensive high-end. Some people have got memberships, some people don't. Can you give us a few examples of the types of businesses that are doing a great job of putting ads out, putting small, low-dollar products out that are paying for themselves? I've seen every single niche be able to be successful with this when their offer is right. I think the only time that we haven't seen people have like success and remember success is defined by just growing an email list and pretty much covering your ads with this. And with that being said, the ones who have flopped are ones that are very broad and the businesses that we, we haven't seen one business that it hasn't worked for. It's just about tweaking the offer, especially when we get into anyone who's in the woo or the healing space, because they want, they don't get tactical with like, what is something that you can give them that's tactical in this SLO instead of things that they can't really measure? And so I think this can work with any industry. We've seen hairdressers have success with it, online entrepreneurs, service provider. As long as you have a back end offer, it's right for you. And you can really get a tangible, specific outcome for this offer. 
it can work. If you don't have a back end offer, I don't think this is the best way to get your business started. This is a more complicated and robust funnel than even like a live launch funnel. So that's really important. So you need to have, like you said, figured out who your ideal client is ahead of time. You need to figure out what it is that you ultimately want them to buy. And then this becomes a low ticket way to get mm, people who are serious buyers to then consider your other offer. And as long as you have that market to product sort of fit, you're sort of heading in the right direction. You mentioned upsells and I just wanted to, again, because people are going to be thinking about this for the first time, I just want to talk about that process. So if, for example, the SLO was designed to help a business make that first sale with a new prospect, like someone ideally who's a warm audience, it doesn't typically end there in my experience. So if I sold people, you know, templates or stock images for say $27, in that process of buying, is it usual or recommended that you then try and bump the sell and offer a second thing there. Do you have any thoughts about that? Because I've seen that, like I spend 27 and the next thing is 127. Then they're asking me for the nine, you know, 997 all in the same sequence. Is that still the SLO model? Yes, but it was so funny. I was at a conference and I hope I can say this. If not, we're going to we reverse it. it. <laughs> but um, yeah, we can delete it. So they said, you don't want your people to be stuck in upsell hell. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so true. We've all been through these funnels that they just like keep going and going and going. And so what I suggest is you have a bump. That's the easiest thing to add. And what a bump is, is just on most software. So Kajabi, ClickFunnels, Kartra, they all have this where you can add a bump order. It's something that's on the checkout page. It's right underneath the order form. And it says like, add this to your order. It's just words typically. And it's just like a quick yes. So for us, we've had a $37 offer followed by a bump order that's 27. We've also done it the other way where we've had an offer that's 27 and then our bump is 37 and they've both converted. They've both worked. So don't get hung up. I've had friends that their bumps are $7, 17. Don't get hung up in this. The only thing I will say is you don't want your bump offer and your main offer to be the same price because then it looks like your client just got double charged double, with some uh, systems. So yeah. <laughs> with this bump, it's an easy yes. And it shouldn't be like far off from the actual offer. It should be complimentary. So with us, we have, we show them how to get up their Dubsado. The bump order is Canva templates so they can design their proposal. So it's like, oh, I'm just going to help you get the proposal. I'm teaching you how to set that up, the elements of the proposal. Now, if you want it to look really pretty, which I know my audience cares about, here's Canva templates so you can make it do it even quicker. So I usually like to say the bump is something that's going to help them get through your process you just sold them quicker. So maybe it's an Excel spreadsheet. Maybe it's Canva templates, like something that's just easy. Maybe it's an audio recording or a podcast or something like that. That's just an easy yes. And so that's what the bump is. That's usually the easiest thing to deliver is the bump. And then where people get stuck is on the next page, no matter if they took the bump or not, they would go to the next page, which is the OTO one time offer. So when you're thinking about this, this should be the only place that they can get this. Like they can't get it anywhere else. And it doesn't mean they can't get the product anywhere else. It just means they can't maybe get it at that price or maybe you don't offer this anywhere. And so we've done mini courses. We have done, um, we've also done where they can book calls with us. If we're selling like a higher ticket program, like here, book a 45 minute. So we lead them to an application. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we say, this is the only place where you can skip all the other hurdles and come straight to a call with us. And then we've done $97 courses. We've done one $97 courses and we're just, and these are courses maybe we normally charge $4.97 for. So don't recreate the wheel. Like there's a lot Mm -hmm. of things that we can always be creating, but it doesn't make sense because we're going to be testing this funnel. We want to be able to plug and play new things to see what converts the best. So just take something you already have. For me, I always pull stuff from my programs, my membership, something like that, and put it in there. We've also done evergreen 
registrations on the back end where they go straight into another evergreen funnel. So it's all about setting expectations because if you do have like a 97, a 197, it's going to increase your cart value, which means you can spend more on ads or maybe you'll make money on the back end. But once again, think about your long term goals. Maybe I don't make as much on a funnel if I do an application, but I'm okay because I know my numbers. And if that application converts into a $9,000 sale, I don't really care if I made $97 on that funnel. All righty. Wow. This could be an episode in itself. There's so much in what you just said. And so we have our 10 to 27, 37, maybe $47 first item. Then on the order form, right on the order form, we add a bump and it can be slightly more or slightly less, but very complimentary and designed to help them get through whatever you just sold them easier, faster, handle any objections. Then on the next page, which we often call the step two page or the thank you page, you're doing a one-time offer. So this is something that they can only get here or they can only get for a limited time. It's not available anywhere else or it's only at this price. Or you walk them into another part of your process, which might be a 15-minute discovery call or an application or something like that. And so what I want to draw our listeners' attention to is that the whole process is thought out. It's all for the same ideal client. It's all working with the end in mind and working backwards from that. And nothing is random. So we're not saying, oh, I have a few PDFs here. I'll throw those in as my one-time offer. It's all designed because you know ultimately where you want that client to go. So um, I love that process. And, um, and I like that you gave us examples of, well, it doesn't always have to be because people get hung up on is it 27 or 37 you know (laughs) or is it better if I do 97 and it's none of that it's about having this hand in glove fit every step of the way so good yeah and we've tried so many different prices and the thing is I think in the online space we get so stuck with like if we charge one thing then we can't go down on that price. And that's not true. No one goes to target. I know y'all are in Australia. I don't think you have target, but we do, we do, we do. Okay. You do. Okay. If you go to like target or the grocery store and one week, something costs $20 and the next week you go and it's on sale for 14, you're not in target asking for a refund. And so I don't know why we get so caught up in this in the online space. So maybe you try 37 and it just does not, it's not the right number for your audience and you drop it down to 27. Now I will tell you on the front end, it usually doesn't matter, but the price can make a big difference on the OTO. Mm -hmm. And we've played with with price a lot. And we've went up, we've went down until we found the magic number for us. So I don't want anyone to get stuck in what that number is Mm -hmm. because you can always change it. Right. I love it. You've kind of already given us situations where it's not ideal. Like you said, you're not going to retire on this or you're not going to replace your, you know, daytime job with this, but are there any other situations where you think I would definitely not use an SEO there. It's not the ideal tool or funnel. I think I'm trying to think, I really don't think there is the only thing that I ever see is one. If so, if you don't have a backend offer, I don't think it's ideal. And then the other one would be if your next level is already really close to the price of the SLO. So if, um, your membership maybe is 37 a month, then maybe your SLO isn't 37. Maybe it's closer to the seven to 17. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that we've seen and got um, feedback from other businesses who have done this is that when their next offer is the same price or cheaper than the SLO, people question that. Why do you think that is? I think that they see, even if it's a reoccurring charge, I think they think like, oh, is this not going to be like, this was good, but is moving forward, is it going to be the same value? Now, the way that we've seen it work is if they buy into it and then in your email follow-up, you give them a coupon code for the price of your membership. So if you have a membership that's $37 a month, this is something that's already in your program and your follow-up is like, use this coupon code and you can get one month free of the membership. We've seen that work, but Mm -hmm. for at least 25 other people, if their SLO is too close to their actual offer, it doesn't seem to convert into their offer as well. That's good to know. That's a really, really great tip. 
Now, I mentioned in the introduction earlier um, that you teach service-based business owners strategies to generate revenue fast and sort of that's your sweet spot. And most of those are women, I understand, too. Would that be correct? Yes, like 99.9%. A little bit like us. And a lot of our audience, while we do have some, you know, product-based businesses, a lot of our businesses are service-based. So you're talking to the exact audience that you normally speak to, except they're in Australia mostly. (laughs) So is there any other advice that you would have for our listeners um, in regards to, you know, generating revenue through the SLO um, system or using this as as a tool in their business? Yeah. So I know that everyone has kind of a different definition of service provider and some of your audience may not have a course, they may not have a membership, but maybe they have their one-on-one services Mm -hmm. in the back end. And we've actually seen this work really well for leading people into your one-on-one services when it's done with them in mind. So one thing that happens is when we create SLOs or even lead magnets as one-on-one service providers is we actually end up creating something that's for the DIYer. And the DIYer is typically not going to be the person who hires you for your one-on-one services. And so when you go into this process, think of what is going to lead them to hire me. And that's probably not going to be like, here's your brand board and your logo. If you're doing brand design and that kind of stuff, it's going to be like, you know, you got to think what is going to lead them to actually hire me one-on-one, not DIY their own services. Cause those are two different audiences is DIYers and people who hire. So keep that in mind when you go in to create this is if you want them to go in your one-on-one services, think about what would lead them to hiring you, not what would lead them to DIYing it. Mic drop. I love that. I've never heard anyone say that before. Yeah. i I see it all the time. I'm like, geez, you are attracting the wrong person if you want them into your one-on-one services because that is a very different clientele as the DIYers and the people who hire. I love it. Brandy Miles, you are amazing. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. I had no doubt that Brandy would give us gold, but I just found myself taking so many notes. It was Mm. amazing, amazing, amazing. Yes, I agree. She's just wonderful. And for anybody that's thinking, oh my gosh, there were so many terms in there. I didn't know, you know, order bumps and OTOs and all those things. We've got something a little later that'll help you with that. But I absolutely thought she was fantastic. And I love that she has been able to be so successful personally and then help so many others. Great. And now um, what are some of the notes you took? (laughs) Ah, Well, I, I think the big thing for the, the reason why I really love self-liquidating offers and, um, you know, Brandy really spoke about it. It was something that we were talking about in the intro to today's show is that it gives you buyers right out of the gate. You're not waiting weeks or months to possibly maybe sell somebody something. You're really coming out with an ad saying here, buy my really thin edge of the wedge, low dollar thing. And so, you know, I really like she said, a buyer is a buyer. And I think that is really such a powerful statement. And I wanted to highlight it because even if somebody has just spent $10 with you or $7 with you, we see, we're seeing SLOs, you know, at $7, um, that is a more qualified person that's now on your list than those freebie seekers that are out there. Because you might have a list of 10,000 people, but a lot of those people are out there. They're never going to buy anything. They're piecing their solution together bit by bit you know, downloading this free lead magnet here and that free checklist there. So you're not building a list of freebie seekers. You're building a list of buyers. And Susie, I've got a friend and he's got 250,000 people on his list. And the only way they could get on his list was to buy something from him. Wow. He has a list, a quarter of a million people who are buyers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Brandy said, look, I've got a smaller size list, not all my, you know, um, not everybody who's going to see your ad is going to click on it. Whereas you could get a hundred people clicking on your ad and opting in for say your free checklist or your free ebook. You might get a fraction of that actually coming through and buying your $7 pack of templates or whatever it is. So her list is smaller, but she made the point that it is more qualified. Her list is small, but they're all buyers Mm -hmm. and you're not going to have as many people joining, but Mm -hmm. they're going to be quicker to make the next 
buying decision because they've already made a buying decision. They've already proved to you that they're buyers. And I just can't underscore the importance of that, of, of having people on your list who are buyers. I love that too. And I know that I have done a lot of lead generation where we've had thousands and thousands and thousands of people say yes to the free thing, but they weren't buyers. And then I've had smaller groups. So let me give you an example. A few uh, years ago, we ran a summit for 5,000 women. And then at the end of the summit, we offered membership to the Her Business Network. This year, we did a coaching program and we had a few hundred women pay $10 to do our Get New Clients coaching program, which I'm very excited that we're going to be running again soon because it was very popular. But it was about, I don't know, 5% or 10%. I don't know. It was much, much, much smaller audience. But the conversion rate, because they had already paid $10, was so much higher than this huge list of freebie seekers. And so, you know, there's different reasons to do different things. But I know for me, ultimately, I'm wanting to people to buy something. So having them buy something small has always been a better bet for them having them, they've already got that buyer behavior and they've already experienced something um, and probably consume more likely to have consumed it because they've paid for it. And therefore they know, like, and trust us a little more. So it makes that next buying decision so much easier. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, I loved how she talked about solving one problem because again, you know, we see this all the time is that we're trying to be broad and her message about being very specific. You know, for her, it was around Dubsado and how to get that system set up. Dubsado is a software program, how to get that set up. And then even the bump that she offered was then very specific to that offer. And so the solving one problem, I think it's hard. It's like saying one ideal client. I think people really struggle, like you pointed out, to just say, I'm just going to focus on one really, really, really narrow thing that I can give them a quick win on. But I think that we just want to be gritty around that idea and just stick with it and find the smallest thing. And usually if we look inside our audience, whether it's a membership or course or customer feedback, we'll often find there's one thing that people are getting the most results from that might be a tiny sliver that we can use as an SLO. The other thing that I really love that she talked about was how naturally one thing led to the other. And so the SLO offer, the primary thing that she was offering that was solving that one problem, the bump was very complimentary to that. And then the one-time offer was very complimentary again and leading them to what she ultimately wanted them to do. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to do the bump or that you have to do the one-time offer with the countdown timer, et cetera. But you want to understand that process that the SLO is not there to get wealthy on. It is there to craft a list of buyers so that they will then buy the thing you ultimately want them to have, whatever that is inside of your organization, which is usually going to be something in high contrast in price to the price they paid for the SLO. But that dance, which we refer to as the problem solution dance, um, we have a podcast episode for that, is this idea that things are complementary. They are a hand in glove fit. I have this. Now this is going to make the experience of that so much easier. I'm going to get results so much faster. And this takes thoughtful um, thoughtful thinking. Is that a term? <laughs> it takes really being thoughtful about how things flow inside of your marketing funnels. So, so, so good. Mm. Yeah, and if you haven't seen that episode, um, we'll put the links to the Problem Solution Dance episode in the um, show notes for today because it really is mm. the key to not only self-liquidating funnels but all marketing funnels. You really want to be creating that sense of understanding what that very first very clear pain point is and then pivoting to solving that, then opening up a new problem and solving that. And that is what will keep people moving forward with you. And I um, I think the, the whole thing about order bumps and, you know, one-time offers and all those things, when you start to get into this, you'll see where your break-even point is. So it's getting to the point, you know, as Brandy said, the traffic game has changed so much that it sometimes leads are really expensive. And so I've got some clients right now where we can't make the funnel break even on that first low dollar something. We actually need the order bump and even the next upsell to make that funnel uh, break even. So you'll start to sort of be able to play with things and 
you know, for, for some people that are getting really low dollar leads, like it costs you a dollar or two dollars to get a lead, then obviously if you're selling something for seven dollars to a good portion of the people, you you stand a good chance of breaking even. But when your lead cost is sort of, you know, $40, $50 a lead, um, then you really do need to start to be fairly soon after that initial low dollar something, be start starting to sell them something more. So again, you'll figure all that out. I think just get started with this and start to experiment is really the key. And, um, you know, the big thing, she asked her about the mistakes and I just wanted to point out, um, you know, she talked about not being specific, not giving people a quick win, not being for a specific who. And then she spent quite a lot of time on mindset. And I really think this is a mindset shift, shifting to a self-liquidating offer, getting buyers on my list, solving that specific problem that my buyers want solved, not my freebie seekers. It is a big mindset shift. So that's kind of the big thing. And, and, the, and I made a little acronym out of the three mistakes that she did share. Um, MO, M-O-W, mindset, over-delivering, and warm audience, because she also said the big mistake people make is just over-delivering, putting too much in. This is just the thinnest edge of the wedge um, that you're selling for this low dollar. And also, I loved what she said about testing it with your warm audience first. Mm, I love that too. And the MOW could be Mao for Brandy Mouse. Mm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's what you had in mind, isn't it? <laughs> um, I wanted to pick up again on that who, you know, not being for a specific who, which you mentioned. And I know we talk about it a lot on this show, but if you're going to go out there, you're going to spend dollars, you're going to put together a funnel, knowing who that audience is, um, is so important. And I love the distinction she made about is that audience, if you're a service provider, is that audience um DIYers, is that your audience or is it people who will hire you? And even though they might have a similar makeup, it's a different audience. So being very clear about who your buyer is at the front end because you know what you want them to buy on the back end. So being very, very specific and going uh, deeper into doing the work of who is this exactly for at the beginning. And again, it goes back to that specificity and specificity. I, I don't know why it's such a um, difficult thing for so many of us to just go more and more and more specific, either in the problem we solve or in who we serve or in what we sell, <laughs> you know, in a lot of those things. Uh, I think because it on the outside, when we see someone successful, it looks like they're doing all the things. Um I don't have an answer for that. I might have to dig into Oh, that I have more. a big philosophical answer, but we might make that another episode. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all righty. So Brandy Mells is amazing. Um, I would love for you to check out her website at brandymells.com and she spells Brandy B-R-A-N-D-I and her last name is M-O-W-L-E-S, brandymells.com. She has a great podcast called Serve Scale Score. Um, saw, excuse me, serve scale saw. And I, we will put the links to this um, on our website. I'll give you a URL. And she's also prepared something, especially for her business listeners. And so if you head over to brandymales.com forward slash her business, she's created um, a video walkthrough of some of her SLOs, including bumps and just taking you through the process. And she's even going to give you a checklist and show you some of the metrics to look out for. This is something I am definitely going to sign up for. So that's at brandymales.com forward slash her business. Now we're going to put all the information because I've given you a lot of details. We're going to put all the information, um, including Brandy's contact info and anything else we've referenced, like the podcast episode that we just referenced, we'll put that all over on our website at herbusiness.com forward slash Brandy, B-R-A-N-D-I. So, so good. If you enjoyed this episode of the show, would you do us a favor and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts and mention Brandy? I'd love to share that with her. I'd love for her to know how much you enjoyed this episode. And the best place to do that is over on Apple Podcasts. That is the big kahuna of podcasts, even though you might be listening on another channel. Um, we would love it if you would do that. Um, the other thing I want to let you know is that um, we do have a Facebook page. Um, if you want to connect with us, I'll give you the details in a moment. But first, I do want to give a shout out to one of our listeners who is actually in the United States. Hello, USA, um, uh, who said this. 
five stars, entertaining, insightful, and actionable. This podcast is so insightful and I've enjoyed every episode I've listened to so far. Susie and Michelle are very skilled interviewers. They do such a great job of sharing their wisdom and I love how they lead meaningful conversations with marketing leaders who bring so much experience and actionable insight to the table. Case in point, episode 170 with Ruth Bazinski. A great episode if you haven't listened to that one. So many amazing tidbits. Highly recommend checking this show out. You won't be disappointed. And the you haven't given us your actual name, but the name that you've used here on Apple Podcasts is A Sobering from the United States. So whoever you are, um, always leave your name. If you want us to give you, you know, a shout out or mention your business, then do that. Otherwise, um, we will shout out just as we did right now. So we appreciate your review so, so much. Now, I mentioned a Facebook page. This is a great place also if you're not on Apple Podcasts or you want to leave us a review on our Facebook page, go for it. Just look for Content Sales Podcast over on Facebook and you'll see our smiley faces. And it's a great place to ask questions and get quick responses from me and Michelle. All righty, Michelle, that is today's show pretty much. What have we got coming up in the next episode? The next episode is all about boof. <laughs> Now, what is boof? Well, you will find out when you tune in to the next <laughs> episode, but your marketing needs more of it. Chances are you are definitely not being boofy enough with your marketing. So we're going to give you a few strategies. First, we'll explain what it is, and then we'll give you a few strategies for adding more boof to your marketing. And just to give you a little bit of an insight, we introduced this idea at our Marketing Success Mastermind, and it went off. And we have seen such a change in the uh, power of the marketing that our masterminders are doing. And that's what's available for you in the next episode coming out in two weeks from now. So if you don't already subscribe to the show, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And then the episode will drop into your feed right as it's released. Michelle, anything you want to say before we go today? Oh, I just want to thank Brandy one more time for just sharing her brilliance and being so generous as well with providing that follow-up resource that I do suggest you go and check out um, as she talks you and walks you through her self-liquidating offer funnels. And yeah, definitely check Brandy's, all her places out, her websites, her social. She's definitely one to follow. She's definitely one to follow. And my thanks as well, Brandy. You're a star and I really appreciate you being here on the show. And thank you for listening to today's episode. We'll see you back here next time on the Content Source Podcast. <laughs>